Have you had that experience where you're reading a scientific paper and you look at some of the figures and think, eh, man, I wish they would have done it this way, or I wonder why they didn't do it this other way. Ugh, it's the same kind of figure in every paper. Why do they keep doing that in all these papers? Ugh. And, and perhaps worse, <laughs> you look at your own papers and you think, why did I do that? Or, you know, my skills just aren't good enough to do this other thing I'd really like to do. Well, those reactions are all a critique that you're forming about the figures that you're looking at. In today's episode of Code Club, we're going to critique a figure that I made in a paper that I published a number of years ago, and we'll see if we can go about making it better. Hey folks, I'm Pat Schloss. A number of years ago, a former graduate student of mine, Alex Schubert, and I put together a manuscript that we tried to get published in the journal mBio that used statistical models to diagnose individuals as whether or not they had Clostridioides difficile infections based on the structure of the microbial community in a fecal sample. As we were going through the review process, again, there was a lot of kind of statistical models and machine learning and kind of jar jargony, wonky stuff. The second reviewer I'll remember, always remember said, I don't want you to dumb it down, but could you perhaps put in another figure that would be a little bit more accessible to clinicians? And we thought that was pretty funny. And so we said, well, I guess we have to put in an ordination diagram. Ordinations, PCOAs, NMDSs, um, are kind of a scatter plot of microbial ecology data that it seems like you just have to have one of these in a microbiome paper these days. Anyway, we begrudgingly put one in the supplement. I've never really been happy with how that figure turned out. Um, if we go to that manuscript here on the mBio website, um, yeah, it's supplemental figure one, way down here. Um, you can look at this. Let me leave the legend there for you to look at. Um, and so here is what the figure looks like. It's an NMDS. Um, and, and I don't know if anything strikes you about this. It's pretty nondescript. Um, we see the non-diarrheal controls clustering on the left, whereas the cases and diarrheal controls cluster on the right. The way this works um, for diagnosing C. difficile infection, if you have a normal formed stool sample, um, you cannot get those tested for C. difficile. You have to have diarrhea. And so these non-diarrheal controls were people that had normally formed stool, whereas the case and the diarrheal controls were both people, sets of people that had diarrhea. And so what you can see is those red and blue points. They look really similar to each other, whereas people with normally formed stool is on the left. Okay, So that was a lot of description, right, um, that I just went through to explain this plot to you. Um, and so maybe that's a problem <laughs> with this with this plot, right? It's not immediately intuitive what the story is that I'm trying to tell. And, and if you look at the caption down here at the bottom, it's not immediately clear what you should be getting from this figure either, right? And so I think about this figure a lot, uh, probably more than I should for a paper that's about seven years old now. Um, and, and, and I think about, you know, that we're always trying to get better in how we display our data in how we try to make our data accessible to other people. And so I've been, I've been making a list <laughs> of notes for a data visualization rubric that I would like to develop that myself or people in my lab or, or you uh, could use to evaluate data visualizations that we have in the scientific literature. Now, uh, it's not like you get like a gold star for everything and you win. Um, and, and you're not going to be perfect on everything because we have constraints, right? There's, there's things that work or don't work um, with everything. So, for example, I might want this to be a 3D ordination uh, to really show off the variation in the data, but it's going to be published in a PDF. So it's a 2D medium. I can't make it 3D, right? So there's limitations that are built in. There's also technical limitations, right? Like I might not know how to make a 3D plot or I might not know how to make a plot like this, right? Um, and so those are technical limitations that are built in. So where I'm going with this is over future episodes of Code Club, I want to work with you to develop this type of rubric um, and evaluate plots and then use R to make the plot and then use R to make the plot better. Okay, so I'm going to go first <laughs> with some of my plots from my research and some of my ideas and maybe use trends, um, plots that are emblematic of trends that I see in the literature. But hey, if you've got a figure from your own work that you'd like me to take a look at and have a discussion with you, let me know. Put a comment down below, email us at riffamonis at gmail.com, and we'd love to get you in the queue to talk about your work. I promise 
I will be nurturing and supportive and we will not rip people apart. So anyway, let me tell you about this rubric that I've got so far. It's all handwritten so far because I'm not really ready to commit it uh, to stone. Um, anyway, so like first things, like I want it to be an attractive plot. Is this attractive? Not really. <laughs> um, the primary question and answer is clear. Does it tell a story? Not really, right? Like we already kind of talked about that. Um, what is the level of effort required by the reader to understand what was going on? Well, you know, I had to go through that couple minute ramble describing what was going on here. Um, needs a declarative title. No, there is not a declarative title here. Um, it has the audience in mind and has some empathy. You know, I think I was trying to be empathetic, right? When we kind of threw the reviewer a bone by making this figure. But, you know, maybe we weren't as empathetic as we could be. That there's more we could do to highlight what's going on in this figure. Um, uh, maximize the data to pixel ratio. Uh, we'll talk more about this later, but I think we're doing pretty well here. There's, it's a pretty, pretty minimalistic plot that conveys the information. Um, consistent fonts, clear typography, size, and bolding. I think it's pretty good. Uh, one thing that kind of struck, struck me when I opened this again for the first time in a while was that the, um, the axis labels are pretty big compared to the legend label, and so the proportions there seem a little bit, a little bit off. Um, uh, good composition of multi-paneled. This isn't multi-paneled. Um, selection of pre-attentive attributes is optimized based on variable type. Whoa, pre what? Pre-attentive what? We'll talk about that later. Um, clear axis values and ranges. Um, not so much, right? Like, because we don't really bound um, the range on the y-axis or on the x-axis. Um, colorblind friendly. Yeah, it's the, the, these colors are pretty safe. Uh, less than five colors, shapes, or line types. Definitely, we have we have three colors, one shape. Um, uh, evidence that the tool overpowered the designer. No, I don't think so. Um, I think I think we knew exactly what we were doing in making kind of an abysmal plot. Um, is there evidence that the designer was limited by their tool, um, which is probably a sign that we're using the wrong plot type? No, I, I think that I think we're good there. So again. This is my first draft at a rubric, and you can kind of see my thoughts as I went through um, building out this plot. And so whenever we build a figure, we always have some type of constraints. And one of the constraints that I think we'll come back to repeatedly with a diagram like this um, is that it, we're working within a, a two-dimensional medium. I, I could make a 3D plot, and maybe we'll do that in a future episode, um, but I still can only see in two dimensions here. Um, the other thing is that another constraint is that it's going into a scientific publication. So scientific publications don't typically have a title across the top of the plot. So again, that's a constraint. Um, maybe if I were presenting this in a talk, I could have a title and I might fashion this a little bit different because again, the constraints have changed between a paper and presenting this as part of a talk. One other limitation or constraint that were imposed with this data is that these are really complicated data. Um, these are the distances between the points are described by some metric of community dissimilarity, uh, which is kind of an abstract, heady topic that's difficult to communicate to a, a lay audience and sometimes to even other scientists. Okay, so that's a lot. We're not gonna get through all of that today by any means, but we're gonna take uh, a bunch of episodes to go through some of these topics with this plot. And then we'll, like I said, try it with some other data from my lab and perhaps data that, you know, you want me to take a look at and we can have a discussion about there. So the first thing I would like to do is use R to regenerate this plot. So this plot, as you might be able to tell, was generated in R, but was generated using base R graphics. Um, and so I'm not gonna do it in base R because I've, to be honest, I've been using tidyverse for so long and ggplot2 for so long, I kind of forget how to make a scatter plot in base R. That's, that's kind of sad to say. I was such a long holdout um, of base R that, eh. I have some code in here. Um, hopefully you saw the previous episode about getting set up in R Studio and getting the data files that we're gonna be working with. I'll go ahead and highlight everything here and hit run to load everything so that I now have this metadata uh, NMDS data frame. And what we will see is that we have axis one and axis two are our two axes for our NMDS. Um, 
And maybe in a future episode, we'll talk about why NMDS and why not PCOA. But there's only so much we can do in one episode, right? All right. So to build this plot, what we can do, I'm going to do ggplot, and then we'll do metadata NMDS. And then our aesthetics, what we want to, what variables we want to map to different components of the plot. So x will be axis 1, y will be axis 2, and then the color I'm going to map um, to, uh, what was it, uh, disease stat, this variable here. And then we'll do geome point. So let's go ahead and run those and see what we get. Uh, and we get something that doesn't look very good. Um, let me go ahead and make this a little bit bigger. So it got great and I hit that refresh button. Everything is good now. Well, good-ish, right? All right. Um, maybe I'll try to make this a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. And so um, what we see is that we've got non-diarrheal control in blue, and that's at the bottom. Green are the cases, and the red are the diarrheal controls. So with NMDS, the axes aren't really constrained. So if you think about this other plot that we had that we published, uh, the grays are the non-diarrheal controls, and they're over on the left. So basically, think about this plot that I just generated and turning it 90 degrees, and I think it'll look pretty close. There's a couple differences between what I'm using now versus what we used way back when. So the distances I'm projecting into the NMDS now are Bray Curtis distances. Previously, we used theta YC. I think they're pretty close for our purposes. Okay, good. So let's go ahead and clean this up a bit to see if we can get it looking more like that previous plot we generated. So one of the first things that we can do is let's change the labels. So we'll do labs, and we can then say x equals uh, NMDS axis one, uh, y equals NMDS axis two. Again, previously we had axis one and axis two. I think putting in NMDS axis one, NMDS axis two makes it clear, again, what type of ordination we used. Um, I'd also like to have a white background, a clear background. Aesthetically, again, that, that data to pixel ratio. And to get that, we can do theme classic. And that kind of cleans up the appearance. Uh, we don't have a full box around the plotting window, but eh, it's okay. Um, let's go ahead and change these colors because the defaults uh, from ggplot are not friendly to our friends who are red, green, color deficient. Um, and so we can do, um, I like to put this in between like my labels perhaps and my theme. Uh, we'll do scale color manual. And then the name, um, I don't need to put disease stat in here, so we'll do name. So we'll do name equals null. We'll do breaks equals, uh, and this is gonna be a vector that we will do uh, case, um, or let's do it in order of, of kind of the way I'm thinking through things. So I will do um, non-diarrheal control and then we'll do uh, diarrheal controls and case. That's good. And then we need to add uh, values, and those are going to be our colors. So the non diarrheal control will be gray. Alex made the cases red, and the diarrheal controls blue. So we'll do uh, So this will be blue, and this will be red. Good. And then our labels, I'm going to grab this vector and copy it down. And for now, I'm going to put in a hyphen there, in lowercase the D, and put a space in for non diarrheal control, diarrheal control case. Um, and let's get my parentheses straight. And we'll put a plus there and bring up the theme classic, give that a rip, make sure everything works, and we're in good shape. Nice. Um, and so again, these titles I'm not totally crazy about because uh, it's not immediately clear what, what we looked at, right? And so maybe what I'll do instead of non-diarrheal control will be to do um, healthy. And then we'll say uh, diarrheal uh, C. difficile negative. And then we can do, instead of case, let's do uh, the same thing. Uh, but we'll say 
uh, C. difficile positive. Give that a rip. And so we get the same idea. Um, it's a really long, really long name. Maybe what we could do is we could say put in a backslash. What does that look like? That's okay. Not ideal. Maybe that's something that we'll think about as we iterate over future versions of this plot. Yeah, that doesn't look great either. One of the things I'm, I'm not really liking is that I've got so much space to the right side of my plot here devoted to this legend, um, and it's just not its just not good, right? So it'd be nice if there was a way to move this legend inside the plotting window, um, but, but we can't. Another thing I don't like is that the C difficile is vertical um, or normal font. It's not italicized. It would be nice for that to be italicized. You know what, maybe I will go ahead and remove the diarrheal. So I think what I'm kind of going through here with you is that uh, there are constraints, right? There, there are challenges that we're running into um, as we do this. So, you know, maybe we could do C difficile neg, uh, C difficile pause, right? That kind of tidies that up, but at the same time, it kind of uh, obfuscates what we're really trying to get at. So I think I'll go ahead and leave in positive and negative and, and um, give that a run and get that right back to the way it looked. And we compare it to what we had published previously. One of the things I notice is that the, um, the, the range on axis one is the same as the range on axis two. And I can get that look by adding um, chord underscore fixed. And this will make the, the, um, the spatial variation on the y-axis and the x-axis the same. So let me show you what that means. So again, I have um, the same distance between like, I don't know, this is like minus 0.6 and 0.8 here. Um, and so that variation is the same as the variation here. Um, and so uh, it gives us a square. And what we see is that we have a nice round circle. So one final thing maybe I'll do would be the do GG save. And we will output this as um, uh, Schubert dot uh, Schubert underscore NMDS dot um, TIFF. And so there you go. Uh, there's my Schubert uh, NMDS. Uh, from 2021, <laughs> and here's my Schubert uh, um, ordination from 2014 or so. Um, and I think you can hopefully see the similarities. One of the other things I did was I reordered the um, the diagnoses groups here, and so um, I like having healthy first, and then negative, C diff negative, and C diff positive, because again that shows. Um, kind of the, the progression of the disease. You know, maybe we could even do healthy um, diarrhea C. diff positive. So if we did diarrhea, and then be sure to run that uh, GG save, and we again see healthy diarrhea C. difficile positive. Yeah, that, work, that works pretty well. Um, something that we'll come back to and talk about is how can we italicize C. difficile positive? One other thing I might think about is how can I shrink the space between these three legend items? They seem pretty wide apart. Um, and so if I do question mark theme uh, in my help over here, this will bring up a whole bunch of options of things I can look at. And so what I'm looking at is the legend. Um, and so legend space, I, I've been through this um, and I'm sure it's actually the legend key height is what we want to look at. Uh, and so let's scroll down to where it describes the arguments for legend key height. And here we are, key height, size of legend keys in unit. Um, great. So we give it a unit using the unit function. Uh, let's add that up here. And we'll do theme. And then in here, we'll do legend key height. And let's do unit, um, I think one let's do cm so it's one centimeter yeah let's see what it looks like right good it's a starting point right so let's come back to our code and we can then say let's do 0.2 centimeters and that looks uh, more compact maybe a little bit too compact i feel like this is kind of squished together i think it's probably squished together up here because we didn't want to get in the way of that point uh, so let's go ahead and uh, maybe do 0.25. That looks like uh, it's got a little bit more breathing room. 
Now, one other thing we could do is let's see if we can move this legend to the bottom right corner here. Uh, and let's see how that works. So another thing we can do in the theme function uh, is legend position. Let's see, that's probably down here further. So legend position. Um, and so we can give it a vector of different elements. So we can do legend.position and we can then say C. Um, so over to the X, let's do 0.9 and then the Y, let's do 0.1. Give that all a run. Uh, and so that doesn't look great, but let's see what things look like in the TIFF because again, things always change when you put it, um, it, it, when you when you render it with a, with a TIFF. So this actually shows me that the background is white uh, instead of transparent. So that means that we need to modify that to do legend background. Yeah, background. Um, and then we can do element rect and we can do color equals NA. And that should then make the background image clear, but it didn't. So let's me look back here. Uh, elements, legend, background. Let's see, element rect. Uh, let's make this, ah, let's do element bl blank. That's good enough. Ah, I think that gets what we wanted. Uh, and we see that the challenge here is that, uh, that we've got overlap and we don't know if this point is part of the overall ordination. So let's move this to the right a little bit and then we can put a rectangle around it and see if that might make it a little bit better. So again, to the right a little bit, let's do 0.95 and give that a run. Yeah, so that bumped it to the right pretty nicely. Again, let's look back at that help for the legend. Um, and maybe we do want that element rect after all. Um, Ah, I think I knew what I screwed up before. So element rect, and I used fill, and fill is the, the or no, I used element, I used color, and color is the color of the border. I think what I wanted was fill equals NA. And let's look at that. So that worked, but we then need to look at the border. And again, element rect, um, we can, let's do line type, or let's do color equals black, because I suspect there's already a line there. So we'll run that. And I think we're gonna have a pretty hideous block, black um, box around it. Uh, the margin is probably too big. So let's see if we can shrink that down a little bit. So there's a large legend margin here. So let's go ahead and try to modify that. And we'll do legend margin. And that takes the margin argument. And let's see. Uh, so we give it top right, bottom left. Um, and so let's do top zero, R zero, B zero, L zero. That looks good-ish. <laughs> there's still a bit of a, a gap up at the top here um, and there's too short on the bottom. So I think I would feel okay if I had a little bit more on the bottom and a little bit more on the right. So let's do bottom left, right one, see what that looks like. It does give us a little bit more spacing I'm noticing. Um, bottom two, right two. That looks like decent spacing still have a fair amount of spacing up at the top there. So I'm noticing a few things I still don't like is that the, the margin between the point and the text is pretty wide. There's also a little bit of unevenness above here. So I think what I actually wanna do is instead of key height, I wanna make legend key size uh, square. So I want it to be a quarter of a centimeter tall and a quarter of a centimeter wide. Let's run that and see if it pulls it together a little bit. Looks like that might have helped. Uh, I have to say, I have to GG save it. So that seems to pull it together a little bit. Um, and then let's work on this margin to see if we can maybe let's 
Let's try two all the way around there. Um, that looks okay. It's a little bit cramped. Uh, so let's maybe put it up to three. And that looks pretty good. There's still a little bit of an extra header space above the title there that I don't like. Let me see if I can put in minus one. Let's do minus two. Uh, see if we get a, a, a minus margin. And that looks good. I like that. Um, one thing I might rather do actually is put that up at the top <laughs> uh, to have it in the upper right corner. Uh, again, at this point, uh, you're just kind of fiddling with things. I kind of like having it in the upper right because as I see the figure for the first time, my eye naturally or eyes naturally kind of read in a Z pattern. And so if my eye starts at the top and looks to the right for and sees the legend, then when it comes down across the image, I can better interpret what's going on. So let's let's maybe put it up there. Let's do 0.9, uh, 0.95. And that looks pretty decent. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly happy with that. Um, I could keep picking at that, but that's why we're going to come back and we're going to look at other uh, ways to play with this figure in future episodes of Code Club. All right. Again, um, I feel like we've made some progress in taking this figure from my paper from many years ago um, and modifying it to be a little bit more attractive. Um, you know, perhaps we haven't made that big of gains, but we have reproduced it and we've added a little bit more information on the axes. Uh, the, the size of the margin of the, of the font is a little bit more proportional. Um, and, and we've got something now that we can work with going forward. Uh, again, thinking about um, that rubric that I laid out at the beginning of today's episode, I think that we've already made some improvements by being more descriptive about the axes titles, um, giving more clarity about what we're looking at here. So instead of saying case, we have C. difficile positive. Instead of non-diarrheal control, we have healthy, right? Um, instead of diarrheal control, we have diarrhea. Um, it's not perfect, but again, uh, we've got constraints, right? We're always gonna have constraints when we're working with data and how we display them to the community. Uh, and again, the constraint that I'm working with here is trying to make a figure that would look attractive within a scientific publication. And as I talked about before, if we look back at the legend for this paper, uh, for this figure, um, it's pretty blah, pretty descriptive, generic, it doesn't say anything. If I were to write this again, it would say something like, um, you know, the, the microbial community structure of healthy individuals is significantly different than the community structure of people with diarrhea and those people with C. difficile infections, right? Um, but we don't know that for sure until we do a statistical test. So we'll have to be sure to figure out how we can do a statistical test within R uh, to build that up. All right, so I hope you found this useful. We're gonna use this as a launching pad for future episodes. So all the code that I've written today, I'm gonna to be sure to put in the notes that are linked below uh, this episode here on YouTube. Again, as I said at the beginning, um, if you've got figures uh, that you're wanting to know someone else's take on and, and what I might do to improve them or what I like or don't like about them, uh, by all means, let me know. Uh, perhaps I can have guests on uh, here and we can we can share together what we like and don't like about each other's graphs. And, and all with the hope of trying to make them better and trying to make it easier to communicate our science to others. All right, well, keep practicing playing with these different techniques and thinking critically about how we present our data. And we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.